Hello everyone and welcome to Cicerone Live. Um, I'm Hannah Stevenson and thanks for joining us. Tonight we are speaking to Paddy Dillon, um, who is a guidebook author and legend of the Wales Coast Path. Um, I'm so sorry, my chair just uh, decided to do something weird. Um, but we're celebrating tonight, we're celebrating 10 years of the Wales Coast Path. Um, I can't hardly believe it's been 10 years already, but it, it has. Um, and the Wales Coast Path is an incredibly special path to anyone who's walked it. Paddy's going to be here to tell you more about it. Um, unfortunately, COVID has had uh, yet another impact on our events. And we were supposed to be speaking to Will Rennick tonight. And he unfortunately has got COVID. Um, he, he's a great guy and he's just run all of the mountains in Wales, raising money for charity. So I really would urge you to look him up. Um, you can see his work at Outdoors Magic. Um, and yeah, he's a, he's a great writer and a really interesting chap. So ha have a look at him. Um, the other really exciting thing that's happening for us uh, celebrating the Wales Coast Path anniversary is that Sarah Williams, who is a Cicerone ambassador, is walking the Wales Coast Path for us and she has just left Anglesey and she's posting daily videos and photos and stories and all of that all over social media uh, while she's doing the path so do check her out as well um, we will put her details up on the screen um, so that you can you can go off and follow her but yeah she's wonderful and she's meeting lots of people who are involved in the path along the way um, so the path itself is 870 miles along the entire coast of Wales. So it's it's not a small undertaking. Um, and when Paddy's done it, he he usually, if not all the time, has tacked on Offers Dyke as well to do a complete tri trip around the whole country of Wales. Um, but most people, I think, probably 870 miles is enough um, <laughs> for them. So. I'll bring Paddy on in a second. Um, what he's going to do is talk about the path for 15 minutes or so, um, and then we'd like to open it out to questions. So if you've got any questions at all, um, please do send them in to live at cicerone.co.uk, or you can put them on here, um, on Facebook, on YouTube, um, Twitter. Louise is in the background taking those questions, so please do get them in. Um, Paddy... Uh, you know, as I said, he is he is a guidebook legend, so he really will know the answers to as as obscure as you can be in your questions. I'm sure he will know the answers. So please do challenge him. Um, and yeah, if you've already done the path, then let us know that as well. It'd be really nice to hear from people who've done it and had a, a good experience. So um, yeah, just get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Um, a final mention that we are working this month with Visit Wales and Natural Resources Wales and the Pembrokeshire Coast Path Association um, on the 10 year anniversary. And that's been really nice to, to work with them and just share our experiences of in, in a way working with the Wales Coast Path um, and talking to lots of people who've done the walk. So, yeah, shout out to them as well. Um, so I will introduce Paddy and Paddy will um, share some pictures with us and talk to us about the path. Hi, Paddy. Oh, well, he'll talk if I unmute him. There you go, Paddy. I have unmuted you. <laughs> okay. Hello there. It's good to be back. Um, so I, I believe you've, you've got some uh, pictures for us and you're going to talk us through the not we did have an email conversation about how quickly you'd have to talk to cover the entire coast path. Well, not... yes. If I gave it 20 minutes and it's 870 miles long, I think that works out at 2,600 miles per hour. So I have no intention of trying to do that. Um, what I do intend to do is just to give a flavour of the path through some pictures and a bit of commentary. Yeah, that'd be great. Lovely. I will uh, leave you to it. Oh, straight away. OK, right. OK, my first picture should be up there and it should say Wales Coast Path or Chlorida of Othea Cymru. And right in the middle of it is what's known as the Dragon Shell logo, which is 
the brand that they use on all Wales Coast Path signposting and literature. Um, so if you see that sign, you know that you're on the Wales Coast Path. It's, a, I, it's one of the best logos I've ever seen for the outdoors, just to combine a seashell with a dragon's tail and then use that um, for the Wales Coast Path. So yes, if you look out for that sign, you'll see it on signposts, you know you're going the right way. If it's some other sign just pointing somewhere else, it won't have that on it. Um, so the entire 870 miles is way marked like this. And because it's right next to the coast, you should be fairly confident you're either following the coast or you're somewhere in a field in the middle of nowhere, in which case you're probably taking a wrong turn. Um, but yeah, one of the abiding features of the Wales coast is this great iron ring, as it was known, of castles. Um, here's Flint Castle, Conway Castle, uh, Beaumaris Castle, Carnarvon Castle. And these are just in North Wales. If we go south, you've got the castle at Pembrokeshire there and Larne. And these are great things to explore as you're walking along. I think the history and heritage of Wales is just fascinating. And, you know, quite apart from just clocking off the miles along the coast, I would say to anybody, be sure to take in the history and the heritage as you're traveling, because it will make your exploration of the coast path all that more interesting. Um, the other thing that Wales is noted for are these great little trains. Um, there are a few of them that actually come right down to the coast. So by all means, take a day off, take a train up into the hills and back again. Um, and you, you should enjoy that immensely. Um, I already mentioned castles. I mentioned trains. Here's a train and a castle um, just to show you that uh, it's such, you know, a, an awesome place to be exploring. There are so many things just turn up um, at, at every corner as you're walking along the, the, the coast path there. Lighthouses are another abiding feature of the coast. This one's at Point of Air. And again, we've got one at Penpole looking out to uh, Puffin Island. Um, this one at uh, South Stack on Holy Island, which itself is an island off the Isle of Anglesey. And um, going further south into Pembrokeshire, we've got one at Strumble Head. Um, these are lovely places. Some of them you can go right up to them. Some of them you can't. But on a good day, they always look interesting. And they've got that all important job of warning mariners not to come too close to the coast because it's horrendously rocky in places. So, um, And then one of the most southerly lighthouses is at Nash Point. There are actually two lighthouses there. There's also a foghorn in the middle. So that must say something about the rather treacherous sub, uh, submarine bar that stretches out from this point well out into the Severn estuary. One thing about the Wales coast path is if you're on the coast, you're on the coast path. If you're in this village, which is Aberfro, then you're on the coast path. If you're in this town, which is Aberystwyth, then you're on the coast path. And if you're in the city of Swansea, you're on the coast path. And that those places, whether it be village, town or city, all have that in common in that they're all linked by the same coast path. So if ever you find yourself just one day in a coastal town or city or village, just explore to either side because the coast path will be there. If you just find it somewhere in the middle and then follow it one way or the other, you can start your exploration of the Wales coast path. And believe me, it doesn't take long to get from an urban area into a rural area following the coast path. Um, but for my money, you know, it's just like the infinite variety you get to follow in the course path. Some places you actually have to cross the sea. This one's at Menai Bridge, an astounding structure, which you will cross twice because you go from the North Wales coast onto Anglesey. And when you've done a full lap of Anglesey, which could take you maybe a week or nine days, you come back across that bridge and then continue down towards the Clean Peninsula. Um, so some bridges you might see twice. Most of them, you'll just cross them once. This bridge is a transporter bridge at Newport, and it's not obligatory that you should cross it, but you can if you want to. If you don't want to, you walk further up the estuary, cross over a regular busy road bridge and come back on the other side. But if you are interested in crossing this bridge on the days that it's open, 
and it has been closed for repairs. You can climb 270 steps and then walk across this rather alarming high-level gantry way above the estuary and come down 270 steps on another leg of the bridge. Um, I find it truly terrifying. Um, I don't know anyone who's actually thoroughly enjoyed it. I think most of the people I know who've been up there have been a little bit terrified, um, but it's there if you want it. Um, but to my, to my mind, the best bridges are the ones that were put in place just because the Wales Coast Path was put in place. There were places where if they hadn't put in a new bridge, you would have had to walk up an estuary for a few miles and back down the other side. And just to make it a little bit easier for walkers, they'd pick a narrow point on an estuary, put a brand new footbridge in and say, there you go, courtesy of the Welsh Government, a footbridge for you to make your life along the coast path that much more pleasant, interesting and easy. Um, so these exist and these were put in place just for you. And by all means, just go out there, walk the coast path and use these bridges. Now, it's not a walk along the beach. Well, some of it is. Um, these delightfully empty beaches are a product of COVID. Uh, there weren't many people out when I was last down there. So um, I was walking along and all the beaches I normally would expect to be very, very crowded were in fact almost deserted. So I had a wonderful time looking at these big, broad, sandy beaches with hardly anyone on them crunching along these pebble beaches with hardly anyone on them and um, had a thoroughly wonderful time. Um, gradually, as restrictions eased last year, everything got busier again. And I guess this year, the summer is probably going to be almost back to normal as far as those beaches go. Um, but then again, in between the beaches are the bits I like best, which are the rugged bits. Um, the highest point on the Wales Coast Path is actually just off to the left of this picture. This is arrival on the Clean Peninsula, and there is no way that the coastal path could actually get round the coast here. It's far too rugged. There's quarry spoil and very steep rocky cliffs, um, so the path actually diverts inland, crosses over a high gap between the mountains. That then is the highest point on the coast path. Everything else is lower than this point. And the rugged bits are the bits I like best. I mean, it's nice if it's an easy path and rugged scenery. That suits me to a T. Um, but I don't mind grappling, grappling with, the, um, with the rocks if it comes to that. Uh, this is at uh, Inishlanuthin, looking towards Snowdonia. Um, wonderful area, slightly off the course path. Not every bit of the coast is on the course path. Some bits you make a detour just to get that little bit extra. Um, one thing I did when I first walked the Wales Coast Path was visit all the little islands offshore, places like Bardsey and Scoma, Colby. Um, I made the, uh, an extra day just to go out and visit those islands. And that's a wonderful thing to do because they're not officially part of the Coast Path. So by all means, add on the extras if it makes your life that much more enriched to go for it. Um, but yeah, I think this one is what's un ended up um, on the cover of the latest edition of the guidebook, which is due to be released by Cicerone any day now. So that's the front cover that's getting on down towards Pembrokeshire. And um, of course, the course path down there already existed in the form of a national trail. The Pembrokeshire course path national trail has a long and glorious history and was instantly incorporated into the Wales course path. So what you find there is the existing signposting remains in place. You still follow the acorn for the uh, national trail part of the course path, um, but also you will see the, the dragon shell logo as well at intervals. But the coast is incredible. If you go there early in the summer, that's when you'll get the flowers, and they certainly brighten up the rough and rocky coastal parts. And then there are all the little inlets, um, plenty of these. And like I say, some of them have been equipped with uh, little bridges uh, just to make things easier. In the past, you might have had to detour a bit inland to get around some of these places. And there's always the, the great variety of scenery, especially on a rugged course path. Every headland, every rocky cove, every time you turn a corner, you're going to see something different. And um, it's just great. It goes on and on in that vein. 
And um, I think that's a, the great appeal of it is just the fact that it's so long and it's so interesting and it's so rich and varied that it's hard to find maybe anyone who would complain about this. It's just so good to have a course path like that handed to you on a plate. And the fact that it was only done 10 years ago, I remember the talk that went before it was opened and I thought it would drag on for years. It actually was done very, very quickly and that surprised me, um, especially to find it was done to such a high quality. The whole thing is a right of way, although sometimes you might find someone else has an idea about who has right of way. Um, if you come across something like this on a path, I advise you to make a little loop around it rather than try and force your way through. But uh, there you go. I mean, the livestock have as much right to be there as anyone else. Um, the heritage of the course path, you'll find monuments to lifeboat uh, coxswains, you'll find monuments to fishermen, um, but you'll also find industry. And, you know, you can't avoid that. It's, it's part of the scene. Um, we bring all our hydrocarbons into Milford Haven and pump them into refineries and distribute them around as petrol and gas. Um, you can't escape that. We need the power and that's how we get it ashore. Um, but at the same time, you know, you can use steel to make a wonderful construction, bearing in mind that if you just turn 180 degrees, there's a steelworks that made it in the first place. Um, so you are going to get this. You're going to get the wonderful rugged cliffs, the great wide sandy beaches, and you're also going to get the big industrial sites. And that's just part of the coast. I mean, they're on the coast for a reason. You take them on board as you go by. And if you don't like the rugged, um, you know, cliffs, you'll get a sort of an urban interlude. If you don't like the industrial sites, there'll be some countryside just after it. So make the most of it. And then, of course, somebody will have the bright idea of brightening up some rubbish line on the beach, like these two cubic concrete blocks. Um, just turn them into a pair of dice and it puts a smile on your face as you're heading towards the distant power station. So there's infinite variety on this course. It's not all good. It's not all bad. It's just varied day after day after day. As you walk along, the scenery changes. And if you don't like it, it'll change to something better and so on and so on. 870 miles of it. I can't go without mentioning the magic roundabout at Cardiff. Just when you think you're snarled up in a great mass of traffic and roundabouts, you're suddenly faced with this as an artistic statement. And um, it put me put a smile on my face as I was passing through one of the drearier parts of the route. So there you go. The magic roundabout at Cardiff. Now, to my mind, the best bit, and I am going to declare this, is the Clean Peninsula, because when I first came across that area, it didn't have the same access to the coast that it now enjoys. Um, I think well over 100 miles of extra coast path were created when the Wales Coast Path was put together. And to my mind, I think the bulk of it was actually on this peninsula. So there are some great new paths that open up areas that were not accessible 10 years ago and all credit to the Welsh government for, for doing that. You know, I mean, it's an immense amount of work talking to landowners, putting the markers in, making sure that everybody goes through and, and basically takes care of that landscape. So every time I've been back to that area, there's been a new stretch of path opened and that includes right up until last year, I was still walking brand new coastal paths in that area. So that's become my best part of Wales. Um, but then again, who would think that there's an atomic power station tucked away just to the left of this picture? Um, you know, be ready for anything around the next corner. Um, so this will be near Wilfer. And um, yeah, when it comes to accommodation, it's entirely up to you. You can camp and have a wonderful view of the coast. You can stay in a youth hostel. There it is high up on the cliff to the right, Puthderry Youth Hostel, looking straight down the cliff into the sea. Or if you want a guest house, there's an old lighthouse keeper's cottage on Great Orm near Llandidno. Again, I mean, not for sleepwalkers, but um, if you like a view and you know what to watch the sunrise and sunset from your dwelling, then maybe go for that option. Or a hotel straight across the, the crunchy beach, straight onto the sands, and there's the sea. 
Um, and if you don't like the hotel, if it's too expensive, note there is a campsite just beyond. So, yeah, mix and match all these accommodation types as, you know, whichever way suits your pocket or your inclination. Um, some places will have abundant accommodation. Some places will have very little. And just be aware of your options day by day as you walk. And if needs be in an area where it's fairly sparse, um, book a day or two in advance. But most of the time, you can generally squeeze in and pick up some last remaining bed. There's also good public transport along the coast, railways in some places, buses in others. And if you do reach a point where you just can't get accommodation, maybe a 10 minute bus ride will bring a whole host of other options um, into play. So, you know, juggle around with these options because it makes all the difference to how easy or how difficult it is to walk the path. And when you get to the end, and this is the end at Chepstow, assuming that you've done what most people do, start in Chester, come all the right way around the course and finish at Chepstow. If you cross that bridge in the background, you are immediately on the Offers Dyke path. And if you follow that northwards, you will be straight back to the North Wales course at Prestatin. And if you do that, then I think your 870 miles becomes just a little bit over 1,000 miles around the entire circumference of Wales. So in a nutshell, just with a few images and by no means in any particular order, that to me is what the Wales course path is all about. Fabulous. Thank you for that, Paddy. I'm a little bit disappointed that you didn't include the sign of the person falling off the cliff. <laughs> I was tempted. I really was tempted. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> always they you know, take care near cliffs, but yeah, they do put signs up reminding you to take care near cliffs. But uh, yeah, the but one it is of the quite a, a funny sign, is because it? it's just an upside down person with some rock yeah. falling yeah. off the cliff, All the rock it... crumbling from under their feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the, the other thing that just stood out to me a lot was that we've found something that terrifies Paddy Dillon. Oh, yeah, that uh, transporter bridge at Newport. The thing is, you're not walking on a solid decking. You're walking on what I would call glorified chicken wire. You can <laughs> see through your toes to the horrendous depths beneath. And it's not, uh, you can tell from the structure, it's like a big piece of Meccano. It's, it's slightly shaky. And um, I mean, I'm sure they wouldn't let you up there if conditions were bad. And it is safe. You know, you're, you're almost in a cage the whole time. But, um, yeah, if you had any heart problems or breathing problems, uh, don't climb those 270 steps, um, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that's that's interesting. It's an option you have on the days when it's open. And I would say take the option, even if it terrifies you. You don't need to do it again. Yeah, yeah, you'd want to. I, I would want to at least have a go. But, yeah. Yeah, I'm quite I'm quite thrilled by the idea that I would I don't think I would find that that terrifying but the, the great Paddy Dillon found it scary. So that's yeah. that's nice to know that even you've got, got limits. <laughs> I've got um, my limits. <laughs> yeah. Um, a, a quick note that I forgot to mention before, um, but we are doing a giveaway on for a, a weekend of walking on the um, Pembrokeshire coast. Ah, Louise has put the details on the screen right now. Um, so if you go to our website, you can find the details there. Um, and you can enter that competition. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Um, but yeah, go and have a look at that if you want to. It's not the Clean Peninsula, but it is Pembrokeshire, which is also incredibly beautiful. Uh, oh, so it is, it's wonderful. I mean, quite apart from walking the entire Wales course path twice, I've walked the Pembrokeshire course path two more times, as well as doing day and weekend visits into those places. So yeah, yeah well worth yeah. the effort. I, I thought it was really nice, actually, that you gave a bit of a nod of gratitude to all the people that created the path and the amount of work that's gone into the infrastructure. Um, things like the, putting the bridges in and negotiating with landowners. I think a lot of people, when they when they go and they walk walk a path like that, they don't necessarily think that it's there's going to be that much to do they just think oh well there's this path and we'll put some signs up but you know 870 miles of negotiations and landowners yeah. and signposts it's yeah. it is a lot well over the years there were certain places where coastal paths had already been put into place like anglesey 
has a long-standing course path. And so when the Wales course path came along, it was basically tidying that up. You know, you, you will often find when you're on Anglesey, you've got your Wales course path signpost and it's also joined by an Anglesey course path signpost. And then in some places, they just diverge for a little bit. But generally, it's the Wales course path that's created a, a slight improvement to an existing course path. Down in Pembrokeshire, I think they didn't need to do anything. The Pembrokeshire course path was already in exactly the places it needed to be. And so all it was a case of doing was just, you know, incorporating that into the course path. But in some places, I mean, I've been delighted um, because I've been there before and found places that didn't have great coastal access. And then you go back and find out they've actually got wonderful coastal access now with all the signposts, the styles, the, the steps up and down on the steep slopes. A lot of work gone into places uh, to make it accessible. But the footbridges, I mean, you, you want to be by the open sea. You don't want to be following a tidal creek for miles inland just to cross yeah. over at a busy road bridge. You want a footbridge a bit further down, nearer the sea. And there's yeah. so many places where that's happened. Um, and then there's one place, strangely enough, called Ferryside, which used to have a ferry years ago. And then the Wales Coast Path was created. And very soon afterwards, somebody took the initiative to reinstate a ferry. Now, what that does is um, you start the morning on one side of the, the river estuary. You finish on the other side, barely a mile away. Um, but it's all day going round and inland and just across a busy road bridge and all the way back again. You do have that option of taking a ferry. I know some people would say, well, that's cheating. That's not the course path. But it keeps you closer to the coast and it's only one day of your journey. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it's wonderful. I mean, that was disrupted because of COVID and I hope it comes back this summer. But uh, it's great to see that somebody would take the initiative to reinstate a ferry that used to exist in the old days and they're doing it just because the course paths become popular again yeah yeah that's great and that also um reminds me so we've got a new a new edition of the book out at the moment it's just been released so um i did want to mention if there is anyone watching this who has got the older editions what you can do is you can get the new one for half price if you use our new for old scheme. Um, it's it's really, really easy. Basically, you buy the book on the website and then you send us an email with proof of your old book and we refund you the difference. Um, if you go to cicerone.co.uk forward slash offers, um, you can find out the details there. But it is, you know, I, I would say it's always worth getting the newer editions of the books because if things have changed, then it could be a whole day that you waste going the wrong direction when actually there's a new bridge that you could have just followed. Um, but we do understand if you've got if you've spent money on a guidebook and then the publisher goes and does another one, um, it can be frustrating, which is why we've got this um, new for old discount. So do make sure you use that. Um, for people who haven't got the older editions of the books, you can use the discount code that's on the screen at the moment. Um, and we're doing 25% off all of our Wales guidebooks this month. Um, if you use the code WALESLIVE25 um, on our website. So, yeah, just thought I'd mention that as well. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in. So thank you for that. Um, please keep sending them in. I can see we've got a couple of um, Cicerone authors that are watching, so I should probably give them shout outs for their books. So if you want to do any cycling in Wales, um, have a look at the Richard Barrett books. Um, he's got one that is just cycling in Wales. There's lots of tours there. Um, similarly to Paddy, he likes using public transport. So there's a lot of options of you can get the train here, you can do a cycle tour, and then you can get the train back or somewhere else so it's a really interesting flexible um book in that way um and we've also got the cambrian way uh cambrian way richard watching um who says i think he's I think he's a bit surprised nobody's mentioned the pubs <laughs> I i'm a big pub person but and i do have <laughs> as many 
many points of refreshment in my guidebook as I can squeeze in. I won't go past a beach cafe or a pub in the middle of nowhere without mentioning it. So they're in the book, put it that way. Um, but I, I don't harp on about pubs. I, I, I use them to get a coffee or something like that. But uh, that's all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Philip has got a question. Uh, she says she's her and her husband have walked nearly all the path in bits and pieces over the last four or five years. Um, they've got 30, about 30 miles to go um, to go to Chepstow this summer. Um, oh, it's not a question. She's just sharing her, her story. She says it's been a tremendous experience and that she's loved it all. Um, I, I think, I don't know if you agree, Patty, but everyone who I've spoken to who's done the Wales Coast Path has loved it. Yeah, I think it's hard to dislike it. I mean, even when I walked it last year, because, of course, to get something out this year for the 10th anniversary, it means I have to do it last year. Check everything, check everything again, double check it, get it all written up, reillustrated, change the maps where the route has changed. But, um, I mean, sometimes I meet people on the Wales course path. I've never met anyone who's been detesting it. They've all loved it. Um, but the thing is, even when I was doing it last year, I got hammered on a couple of occasions by violent storms. And there was one day, one day especially, when at the end of it, or even well before the end of it, I honestly wished I hadn't gone out that day. But that doesn't mean I didn't want to be on the course path at all. That's a completely different matter. Um, you know, I mean, I, I take the storms as they come because... It's one thing to walk by a sea which is as smooth as a mirror and as blue as you can imagine, but it's quite another to see massive waves hammering into the cliffs and, um, you know, struggling to stay upright. You've got to have those days to balance out the nice days. Um, but, yeah, I got hammered by some really severe storms. And even though it was hard work, I still wasn't ready to just throw in the towel and said, you know what, I'm going home, blow this, I'll come back when it's nice. Um, no, I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, it's easy enough to get dried off when it's been a bad day, get warmed up, get some food in you and then see what the next day holds. Um, but yeah, if you want to avoid those sorts of things, such the weather forecast, they're free after all. Um, but no, fair enough um, to people who will spread the achievement over several years, because I've done this in single bites without even taking a day off and I enjoy doing that but if you do a bit here and there a weekend or maybe a week of a holiday and add it up over four or five years or whatever um you're just extending the enjoyment it's, it's going on forever you know I mean when I have finished it's finished but if someone takes four or five years over it I, I reckon they're getting a lot more enjoyment out of it and not everybody can take off the amount of time you need in one yeah. go to you know 50, 50 odd days or yeah. whatever to do it all in one go that's quite epic um with with the storms and stuff i know you know when we every summer it seems like there's bits of the south coast path that fall in the southwest coast path that fall into the sea yeah. What's the Wales Coast path like? That? Well, it suffers the same way. You know, if you get a bad enough storm um, and it hits the bottom of the cliff or even the promenade, um, I mean, if you've ever gone into Aberystwyth after a storm and see the damage that's been done to that promenade on a couple of occasions now, um, you know, even demolishing, um, in one instance, a, a Victorian seaside shelter, which has probably made a good cast iron posts in it. Um, but yeah, it, it can do severe damage and it does take time to fix. And then when it's fixed, you don't know when it's going to happen again. Um, but yeah, what happens generally is if there's a, a, a path closure because of, um, you know, it's gone over the edge or there's been a landslide, they will divert it fairly quickly. And that has happened within the course of the first edition. Um, the path I checked way back when I did the first edition, I think two years later, there'd been a landslide and the path was closed. You had to go around by road. But now it's been fixed and it's grassed in or the vegetation's recolonized the, the repairs. And it's actually you, you have to step back to spot the bit that vanished because they made such a good job of putting it back. And then in another instance, um, uh, a, a part I came across uh, last year had obviously been repaired fairly recently, but the entire path had been moved up slope because the bottom part had become damaged. And you could see the bottom part 
plain as day. And yet I'd be up here thinking I was down there last time. Um, so some places it's quite obvious what's happened. Other places it'll be closed. You're, you're temporarily inconvenienced because you have to go around. Um, but it will be fixed in due course. And I think that's one of the great things about having, you know, sort of the government behind a, a course path is that you're going to get it fixed a lot quicker than if it was just an ordinary course path, you know. So, um, yeah, yeah, you know, fair play to the the people who keep it all in, in good shape. Yeah, they're very proactive, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Um, OK, we've got a couple of questions about stats. So right. do you know how many people have completed the path so far? I don't because um, not everybody will say that they've completed it. I know that the Wales Course Path website has what they call the Hall of Fame. Um, so people who've, you know, say, oh, I'm full of it. I've completed the Wales Course Path. Put me in your Hall of Fame. They'll do that and they'll get a few words of a story out of you. Um, unfortunately, I've never done that. You know, It's something I tend not to do, you know, sort of uh, put my name forward for, uh, you know, the glory of it or whatever i just i just write the guidebooks but uh, yeah so i'm not in all the fame so that's one person who's who's not been listed uh, yeah there must be there must be hundreds i reckon um when i first walked it and it was only open for one year because that's the thing it, it happened so quickly i didn't realize it was going to open <laughs> as quickly as it did so i didn't get to do it until the following year um, in fact, you know, I, I was asked to do the guidebook after it had opened rather than negotiate all that before it opened and then, you know, sort of chase after and get something publication for the day to open. That would have been ideal. But, yeah, it was a, a year later. Um, but I didn't think I would meet that many people in its first year, but I actually met five people. And given that most of them are actually going the same way as me, it's actually very hard to meet someone unless they started more or less when you did, or maybe if they slow up or if they're coming faster from behind you, um, you'll meet them. I was surprised to meet five people because there are times when I've done the Southwest course path, which has been going for donkey's years, and I've not met five people on the entire trail. Mm. Um, so that, that really did surprise me. Of course, last year with me going there, the day that you were allowed to go <laughs> after the covid regulations were eased um i didn't expect to meet anyone and in fact i met two so you know even that surprised me but yeah, yeah i reckon there were people chipping away at it all the time now yeah richard has said actually that they reckon each year ten thousand people walk three days or more on the path that wouldn't surprise me um, at all you know there's yeah. so many people you meet just walking the dog or just walking a stretch and um, because the great thing is if you've got um stations on a train line three to four miles apart you can you can do that stretch jump back on the train and get back to wherever you started and there's yeah. so many parts of the course that actually have that access yeah it, well he says it's amazing you don't see anyone on on long sections of it mm -hmm. um and i think i mean it is it is a massive path so there's a lot of place for people to to disperse along the path i guess um but yeah, it's it's a popular route. Um, and then we've got a question. Do you know how fast, um, what's the fastest time anyone's done it in? Do you know? Oh, I, I know that it was run the year it opened, possibly just before it opened. And that was a woman, Ari Beresford um, something. I, oh. I, I think she's remarried and got a different Ari name. Kane. But a -Y. Yeah. Ari and, Kane um, is her new yeah, name, yeah. actually. She I didn't realise she was the fastest. Of, uh, yeah, she ran it at the rate of a marathon a day, <laughs> which is absolutely stunning. You know, I mean, no way, no way would I do that. But um, there may be people who've done it faster than that. I just don't know. Um, I think the there's somebody who you may be intending to mention, Sarah Williams. She's intending to take 50 days over it. Now, in my guidebook, I suggest 57. Um, I've done 57 myself. I've done 56. Um, so I know what it's like when you just contract it by one week and say I'm doing it in 50. I know what will happen to some of your days and how much harder they will get when you start extending them. Um, so good luck to her with that. But uh, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if it's been done in a, a lot less. There are people who will do what they call um, FKTs, fastest known times 
of various trails. I don't recall seeing a fastest non-time list of Wales course, but there may be. It might be a case of Googling it and seeing what turns up. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, I know Sarah Williams, I think she fast-packed the first couple of days, and so she was maybe doing it that way, just running running bits and trying to get it a bit faster. Um, but, yeah, it's actually, as soon as she said... Um, Sarah Williams is friends with and has interviewed um, Ari Kane for the for her Tough Girl podcast. Um, so that's her married name. Um, right. I don't know whether she's still the fastest person, but yeah, check her out as well. And if you if you follow Sarah, you'll see links to that episode anyway. Because um, I think she was walking. She she's walked some of the path with her yeah. this time when she's she's walking it at the moment. So. Yeah, that's really it's really nice. Um, yeah, I'm I'm surprised someone like Damien Hall hasn't tried to do it in <laughs> seven hours or something ridiculous. Well, I, I read a short account of his um, run along the southwest course path, and basically, I think every day involved a really good cry. Now, <laughs> given that the southwest course path is 630 miles, and you're finishing in that sort of state, I just wonder what happens when you just keep adding on like another couple of hundred miles and you're still in desperate need of a really good cry at the end of it. I mean, you know, my, my mind just is boggled by anyone who can do things like that. But, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, just reading his short account of the Southwest Coast Path, I thought it, it would be just so much difficult to do that with the Wales Coast Path. But, yeah, maybe somebody's done it. I, I, I haven't actually thought to check even, so... I think That's Damien right. Hall did the Southwest Coast Path in like eleven days. I think it, just, it was yeah, it was. It, it just wasn't much, sleep. you know. And I'm I'm thinking when I first did it, it took me twenty eight days exactly. And I would not recommend anyone to do that. I I forget how much I give it in the book. It's something like forty five or something. You know, it's a lot more humane. But <laughs> <laughs> It's no good use. I mean, some people are up for a proper challenge. Good luck to them, I say. But um, if you just want to enjoy the course path, I think you have to do what most people would do with a long distance trail of any sort. And that's give it 12 to 15 miles a day. And, and you know, occasionally go a bit further if, say, the accommodation is 70 miles. By all means, go for it. But, um, you know, I, I think you have to aim to enjoy it rather than just destroy yourself on it. <laughs> yeah, I think that is a, a really good point. You do you do want to enjoy it. So whatever whatever works for you, if you're doing it week by week or if you're running it or yeah. Can you can you cycle the Wales Coast Path? There are some stretches which are actually on a cycleway. Um a significant part of the North Wales coast is cyclable and is actually well used by cyclists and um, there are other places let me just think of them there's a stretch of cycleway between um well i suppose on the way to carnarvon there's one there um and then there's another well there's some good stretches down on the south wales course path especially in the urban areas you know if you're going across the uh, the barrage at cardiff you can cycle that um, in and out of Swansea, I think, is all on cycleways. Um, so, yeah, there are parts you can cycle. And then, of course, there are those rugged cliff paths, which are designated public footpaths. You do not cycle those anyway. Um, you, you just enjoy those on foot. But, um, yeah, some parts you can cycle, some parts you can really eat up the distance. And I have to say, when I set off the first time walking from Chester, out towards Flint, and almost all of that is a cycleway. When a cyclist whizzes past you, and within two minutes you've lost sight of them, and yet for the next hour your scenery does not change from that, you know, sort of vanishing point of a, a tarmac track, um, you begin to wish you'd brought a bike. And then, of course, I have gone back. I have gone back with a bike and just raced along that and thoroughly enjoyed it. But it is a different experience than walking. Um, but yeah, I mean, some parts of it are cyclable, not all of it. And if you wanted to cycle the course, you'd be chopping and changing between places that can be cycled and places that just can't. They're just too yeah. rugged. Yeah. 
So Alan Kane, thank you, Alan, for doing this. This is the wonder of the internet. It's amazing. So Alan Kane has has Googled the uh, fastest known times for male and female. This this is just stonkingly fast. So the fastest known time overall is by a woman called Sarah Thompson. Um, and she did it in 24 days in 2016. Wow. 24 yeah. days. I, every day that I walk, I'd have to do more than two days every day to to achieve that, you know. So that's never going to happen for me. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, uh, I mean a cool performance. <laughs> the, so the fastest, the fastest male who's done it is Lee Butters. He's done it in uh, twenty six days and fifteen hours in twenty seventeen. So. Yeah. Still yeah. doesn't help me. I mean, you know, I'll I'll stick with fifty-seven days. It's, it's just <laughs> right, right for me. <laughs> but I mean, I'm I'm in awe of people who can do that. I mean, I I really do that. I just hope that they enjoy the scenery at least. But when it comes to things like the heritage features, where you stop and look at things and read the little notice board that's there, you can't do any of that when you're going at speed, you know. So I I think maybe they lose a little bit on that side, but. I mean, at the end of the day, you can read all that up afterwards, you know, read about the places you've been. But um, <laughs> I do like to stop and look at things and, um, you know, stretch out my days um, on the coast. <laughs> yeah, it's not for everybody, is it? That? Yeah. yeah. Um, Linda has got a question, and I can't imagine that you've been able to do this, but have you ever totted up how many miles you've walked in total? You mean like in my entire life? I think that's what she means. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I could get that figure right now, but I'd have to drop out of this. So, I mean, I can try and I can try and get it, but I'll, I'll just have to. Um, oh, best not mess it. with the tech. Maybe we'll yeah, maybe we'll just have to. Tech. I mean, I, I can find it, but um, <laughs> not too easily. That's the only thing. Um, yeah, it would I mean, have been good to, as soon as you were born, just stick a Fitbit around your wrist. Yeah. And just... I may I may have a paper version somewhere just a second. <laughs> to get something. Oh, here we go. This will give you some idea. I've got to add on some extra, but let's say um, <laughs> um, 108,000 kilometres are plus some. <laughs> 108,000 kilometres. Kilometres plus a little bit, because I haven't, I'm not fully up to date with that printed sheet there. So <laughs> yeah, I told you I could lay my hands on a figure. It's just not the, it's not as of like um, two days ago when I last was out walking. So. Wow, I really didn't think that you would have that to hand. I don't know why, knowing you, I, I should have expected that, of course, you'd know that. Um, we've got a question about wild camping, and this is yep. a bit contentious. Um, yep. <laughs> how easy is it to wild camp near the path? And that's uh, Desperately there. easy, but of course illegal. Um, you know, the... If you are proper wild camping, it means you've not asked anyone for permission. You just decide this is a nice place to put my tent. And the thing is, yes, it's illegal. Yes, it happens. You know, I mean, like I, I've done it. I know other people who've done it. When I'm walking, I find people doing it, you know. And, you know, by and large, nobody's causing any harm to anyone. Um, it's a case of, you know, the best approach is you find somewhere capable of taking the tent without you having to hack and slash at the undergrowth you know just a nice little place my tent would fit there and I'll be comfortable but it's also out of sight and it's also it's going to be a low-key camp you're not going to make any noise you're not going to make any mess um, when you pack up in the morning it must look as though you were never there now if that happens if you camp for the night and if when you leave in the morning, it looks like you were never there and nobody on this entire planet had any idea you were there, then I would say, what's the problem? Um, but that's just my personal view. But I also have to say, yes, it's illegal. You know, if you got caught, you would not go to jail. It's not that sort of illegal. It's a civil offence, not a criminal one. It becomes a criminal one if you chop somebody's tree down and make a campfire out of it. You can be sued for damages then. But, um, yeah, I mean, while camping, it happens. People do it, and it is actually quite easy to do on the course path. But, you know, when all said and done, you should at least try and find out whether it's okay to camp there. 
if it's late at night and you're, you're running out of energy and you're not going to get to where you thought you were going to be, if you have a little tent, I'd say that's good insurance and just plunk that down for the night, clear off early in the morning, no one will be any the wiser. Um, no one's ever found me wild camping in this country. Um, the only people who found me wild camping in another country turned up with two shotguns, but I was able to talk my way out of it in a foreign language and um, everybody was happy. <laughs> we need a whole a whole other live event on that. But where was that? It was Sardinia. <laughs> I mean, I camped in the mist, so I didn't realise how close I was to being seen when the mist wasn't there. And it was six in the morning when these guys turned up in full camo with um, <laughs> shotguns. But um, I had about five words of Sardinian, which are, uh, of Italian, which I kept recycling on them until I wore them down. And uh, by that time, I rolled up my tent and I was ready to go anyway. <laughs> I mean, everyone who knows you has knows that you are a talker. But talking your way out of um, being shot by two men and a shotgun with a shotgun—that's with only it's... five words. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't recommend that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we, I mean, we'd always, we'd always say with wild camping, just, we, you know, we can't tell you that it's fine to do and yeah. you always have to leave no trace. But yeah, yeah I mean, I, I spot, I spot maybe, you know, a dozen sites every day where I think that would be great for a tent, but I can't put them in a guidebook. But I can assure anyone who follows my guidebook, you will come across those places as well. You know, they're out of sight. They're ideal for wild camping. And, um, yeah, if you put your tent there and if you abide by the rules such as they are, which is basically don't let anyone know you're there and don't let anyone know you were there by the time it's time to leave. It's got to be absolutely spotless. I mean, I even, like, brush the grass back upright when I'm gone, you know. And don't leave it flat. It's like brush the grass back up. Let's take a step back, look at it, say no one will ever know I was there and then just walk on yeah yeah so not a man sleeping in a tent that would be a weird answer to this question but Richard wants to know what's the weirdest thing you discover you've ever discovered on your walk oh you mean on the Wales coast path or just in general no I think we should probably keep it to the Wales coast path just in case right <laughs> I don't know offhand um I mean there's so many there's so many things happen every day that you know sort of make you prick your ears up and think well I wasn't expecting that you know I mean you could walk around a corner and I wasn't expecting that view you know but um I I, I don't know offhand of anything really weird that's happened on the Wales course path you haven't uh, mentioned yet Hannah and the donkey well Hannah and the donkey that was that was odd because um I had set off on the Wales course path the first time I think I'd only been walking about five days or something and it was a horrendous heat wave. Everything was shimmering. And in the distance, I honestly believe I could see a woman with a donkey walking towards me. And much as I rubbed my eyes, this, this vision would not go away. And it turned out it was a woman with a donkey. It was uh, Han Engkamp and the donkey Chico. And uh, I was going to say something sensible about, you know, what are you doing walking like that but what blurted out of my mouth was something more along the lines of where the hell are you going with that donkey and um she very politely said she was uh, just walking with the donkey all the way around Wales from Aberystwyth and back to Aberystwyth now given she was going one way I was going the other I just said oh well we're destined to meet again somewhere probably South Wales um and then of course I, within five minutes I was kicking myself thinking you never asked who she was. How, how are you going to get in touch? Where, where are you? How are you going to see if you meet again? And then, of course, I thought, well, how difficult can it be with the internet? Woman walking around Wales with a donkey. Oh, there we go. The Facebook, <laughs> the website, the you know <laughs> everything, the Twitter account. Um, so yeah, I was able to keep in touch then, and we did eventually meet in South Wales. And then when I was on the course path this last time, um, Hannah very graciously came out and walked with me one morning. And um, then wrote a piece about me in country walking as well. So there you go. There was uh, she brought lunch, and I give her everything she needed for an article in country walking. <laughs> <laughs> but you yeah, don't that, was, that was odd. You don't often meet people walking with a donkey, but I do know enough about Hannah's experience with the donkey to convince me 
never ever to go on a long walk with a donkey. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I I take my hat off to her. I mean, it was an incredible journey. She did a book and a DVD about it. You know, so it was superb as a story. But I just know having met her and having read the story and watched the DVD, how difficult it is um, to walk with a donkey. It's it's not my cup of tea. I'll walk with me in a pack on the back, you know, I'll carry everything. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a wonder that the donkey didn't accidentally fall off. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's a remarkable donkey. I mean, for all that walking it did, it was in absolute splendid health. You know, whenever anyone came out and said, oh, you know, I'll just check his hooves, make sure he's not suffering with all this walking. Hey, they're really good condition, those. You know, I mean, that's great. It's great to hear that. Um, so, yeah, but, um, I, I mean, I, I learned stuff from her experience about donkeys that I never knew, you know, and, it is, and that makes it so interesting, you know, and especially such a different journey to mine because if you walk with a donkey everybody will stop and talk to you if you walk with a pack on your back you're just another walker you know somebody else talk to you but not everybody <laughs> yeah I, I guess you yeah you're always going to meet someone who's who's doing something interesting I think there's quite a lot of people do these big long walks for charities now don't they and yeah and yeah I've met people doing that. that yeah 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 um Okay, so Alan Kane has said that is amazing mileage on the 108,000. Um, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> even if you were 108 years old, that yeah. would still be good mileage. So mm. it is it is incredible. Yeah, that is incredible mileage. Um, oh, this is not a Wales Coast Path related question, but what's the first long distance path that you walked? That would be the Pennine Way or most of it because... Yeah. The Pennine Way is long enough. I didn't walk all of it, but I did walk further than the Pennine Way. I used to live in Burnley in East Lancashire, six miles off the Pennine Way. So it was an easy thing to put a rucksack on my back with all the wrong equipment in it at the tender age of 16. And with my dad yelling after me, you'll get arrested for vagrancy, mark my words. Um, £17.33 in my pocket. I came back four weeks later having walked to the Pennine Way, walked northwards on the Pennine Way, got as far as Cross Fell, cut across to the Lake District, climbed a load of fells, come back through the Yorkshire Dales, and um, I, I think my money finally ran out at Gargrave. I was 30 miles short of Burnley and only had 12 pence to my name, so that was two pence for a phone call to my auntie to pick me up and 10 pence on a bag of chips, which was absolutely <laughs> marvellous. <laughs> I think it's really interesting. Well, that was my first long distance walk. It was horrendous, absolutely horrendous. <laughs> but one, one thing that Kev Reynolds always said, and that I'm sure I've heard you say, Paddy, is that the reason why you do this job is because you weren't ever able to get a proper job. You just walked instead. <laughs> and and I just think that's marvellous. Like you've yeah. created your whole career is walking and writing about walking. And and the idea that it's because you you know oh, I just couldn't get a proper job, so I went with <laughs> started walking and I haven't stopped. I I had a job shortly after leaving school. It was in a town hall, and um, I think it was the chief admin officer grabbed me by the collar and said, "On no account," he said, um, "should you be working here." He said, "I've watched you come in on a Friday." with your rucksack, he says, and then God knows where you've gone, but you've still got the rucksack on on the Monday morning. Um, he said, it's clear that you've been off somewhere over the hills, he said, so you should not be working in an office, you should be working outdoors. Now, I took that a bit much to heart because the next job I got was um, digging out rhododendron stumps in February oh, in the pouring rain and, and trying to burn them on a fire. Um, that brought me to tears. I was on my hands and knees. I was in tears. They they don't dig out. They don't burn. Not in February when it's raining anyway. So I, I decided some outdoors jobs were not for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that doesn't sound fun. Right, we're pretty much we are out of time. So just in, if you can do a quick answer, do you have a favourite town or village on, on the route to take a rest day? Oh, I don't do rest days. I know it sounds awful. It sounds like I'm I'm doing myself an injustice. 
But if I had a day off on a long walk, I'd go for a walk. So there's no point having a day off. I mean, I can't sit on a beach. I can't lounge around in a pub. I can't do anything like that if I'm on a walk. So it, it's just like every single day I'll just be walking. Um, so if there is a nice town or village, I mean, I'll enjoy spending the night there maybe and then I'll leave the next morning or I'll pass through it and maybe take a break while I'm there for something to eat and drink. Um but yeah, it's uh, I unfortunately I don't take days off. It sounds terrible because some people automatically build in their days off, and I automatically don't have anything to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's why you're such a machine, I guess. Um, right, we we're gonna have to leave it there. Um, but thank you, Paddy, as ever, very entertaining and informative. Um, it's it's just great to hear all these mad stories that you drop into the conversation. Um, I think we could probably have a completely unplanned live event just talking to you about crazy things that happened, um, and it would be it would be fun. Um, but we were talking about the Wales Coast Path because it is ten years old this year. Um, we're doing the discount on all our Wales guidebooks because we are promoting how wonderful Wales is. Um, so you can use that code Wales Live Twenty Five. Um, do catch up with Sarah Williams on the path as well because she's she's great and it, she will just in 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 the nicest way possible she does all the stuff that Patty doesn't so she's all over social media um, <laughs> taking the social media world by storm um, which I'm sure Patty would just say she's absolutely welcome to um, yeah. so you just get a different <laughs> side of 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 things with that. Um, we will turn this episode into a, a podcast episode as well. So you can listen out for that in a couple of weeks time. And this live event will stay on our YouTube channel, on Facebook and on our website. So if there's anyone that you think might enjoy it, um, who hasn't been able to watch it tonight, um, then please do share the link with them. You can sign up to our newsletter to hear about future events and, um, what else have I not mentioned? We've got about a thousand articles on the website, um, plenty of them written by Paddy um, and some written by the other Cicerone authors who are here tonight about cycling in Wales and about the Cambrian Way. Um, there's, there's just tons of information. So have a look at cicerone.co.uk. Have a good dig around um, and see what takes your fancy. If you've got any comments uh, for me or if there's anything you'd like us to do a live event on in the future or a podcast, if you send us an email on live at cicerone.co.uk, um, I will certainly take that into consideration. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for, for turning up tonight, especially Paddy, and hope to see you next time. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>